people cannot live individualistically, as Americans are fond of thinking. They can only live in sociological units. They have to have families. They have to have something the equivalent of a, a nation or some kind of a larger encompassing body. There has to be an economy. There has to be some way of exchanging goods, whether it's by barter or by selling or what. Um, and so it is, we might say, the will of God that there be institutions, systems, and structures. Uh, Gerhard von Rod argues that the creation stories in Genesis are not, um, d don't end in Gen Genesis 3 with the uh, story of Adam and Eve, but the creation continues with the uh, creating of the table of the nations in Genesis 10. That is to say, people are not ready to get history moving until they got their larger uh, uh, political uh, frameworks with, with, within which to live. But that doesn't mean that any God endorses any one particular system or, or, or a nation or, or economy. It simply means that these are necessary for human life and that they have God's blessing in that sense. Now, all of these institutions, though, are at the same time fallen. They're, at the very same moment that they're good, they're also fallen. Which simply means, it doesn't mean they're totally evil. That's a misunderstanding. Uh, fallen just means they're no longer uh, in harmony with their divine purpose. They've, they've set their own self-interest higher than the, the interest of, of God and of the general good. Um, so that uh, every institution, no matter how much good it does in society, will at the same time be doing some kind of evil. They may be producing a very fine product but have terrible personnel policies or something of the sort. And at the same time we want to affirm a third thing, which is that these powers can be redeemed. Now, these things have to all be held together simultaneously. Because if you just say the powers are good, then you seem to be baptizing every institution that comes along. Uh, the, uh, the, the rulers of South Africa during the reign of apartheid insisted that the Bible legitimated their rule. <laughs> Romans 13 says it's all right, uh, uh, that, there, uh, that it's necessary that there be powers and principalities that uh, and we must be submissive to them. But if you say that by itself, it becomes a form of oppression. So you have to simultaneously say they are fallen. The system of apartheid in South Africa was evil. And that it can also be redeemed, which the system of apartheid was, insofar it wasn't redeemed as such, but it was overthrown. And in its place, a new government has come into being, which is um, really one of the most remarkable uh, events in the history of the of the world. So th this is the, um, the framework for our discussion uh, in this session. Powers are good, powers are fallen, powers can be redeemed. What does that mean in practical life? I think the hard part has been for folks to see good in systems, uh, especially those who have worked for transformation, who have worked for some kind of change. You see something that looks like apartheid. And you say, how can this possibly bring forth anything good? And the theology at its very core gave way to something new. I mean, there you were mean the public, old apartheid, the theology. Old apartheid theology that says this is the rule and this is the good and this is the way God calls us to live, um, was exposed, unmasked for what it was, repented, went through very public pronouncements of falling away, folks who had said forever, this is God's will, standing up and saying, I no longer believe this is the will of God. And so as it began falling apart, people saw new possibilities for redemption of this thing. And in people where they thought there had been no possibility of conversion, it in fact was made public and visible. So that the most violent, one of the most violent governments in the world, highest rate of incarceration, its very first act is the abolition of the death penalty. You know, as you speak of the South African triumph in terms of the liberation of that land, the idea that something could be both good and that it is fallen and that it is redeemed at the same time, mm -hmm. that becomes a healthy uh, conceptualization because even in post-apartheid South Africa, we do not have a perfect society yet. I remember back in the 60s, in the late 60s and early 70s, everybody thought institutions were the cause of all the evil in the world, it seemed like, around universities especially. <laughs> so we had all these university shutdowns and so forth that were going to improve things, and in some cases they might have. But um, 
but the assumption was that the institution as such was evil. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to get out of these institutions, so they went off and formed communes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, which are super institutions because you've got to have meetings every night to decide who's going to clean up the kitchen. Uh, so, so even when you, uh, when you go through the, all three of them, mm -hmm. even there you have to say they can only be redeemed within the framework or the reality of a, of a society which is also fallen. Mm -hmm. So the amount of redemption that's possible itself is limited by the fact that you're still existing in a fallen world economy. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, 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 you're existing in a situation in South Africa still where there's a tremendous disparity between rich and poor, and so crime has just escalated to the point that people who weathered the apartheid and said, I won't leave, are now leaving simply because of the fear of, of everyday crime. So that uh, the, the miraculous transformation there is still made within the framework of a fallen reality, mm -hmm. which is a good <laughs> reality ultimately because it's created by God. Mm -hmm. So these things kind of have to be kept together and circled back on each other so that we don't create uh, utopian illusions about how much improvement and transformation mm -hmm. it really is possible for us to bring about with this side of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. We can make some changes, but we can't bring in perfection. And we don't fall into the dualism which I think is prevalent right now in our world. People are dividing everything into good and bad. The rhetoric uh, in almost any political discussion, particularly in this country, is to label something. And as soon as it has been labeled not good in my eyes, it gets dismissed. It's not dealt with anymore. We just write it off. We push it over to the side. Um, so that people expect miracles from anything that gets labeled good and expect nothing from anything that gets labeled evil, which then doesn't allow us to engage in the reality of the powers that are coming into being. So if the civil rights movement didn't solve everything, then it's not okay, and we don't need to talk about it. It was a waste of time. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it hasn't solved everything. Clearly, there are still mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. Do you know, this could be helpful to us in our discussion these days about the role of government. All across the nation, people talk about, ah, too much government, too little. Then it occurs to me that maybe the ones who want to make government the solution to all our problems have the notion that government is good, the more the better. The others who want us to begin to cut back government because government is bad, the attitude is government is fallen. And maybe the truth is that government is a mixed bag, mm -hmm. that some of the things they do reflect their fallenness all too well, and others could be a reflection of good, and that in order to talk about the appropriate role of government, we'd have to have some vision of what the government exists for. And it requires, I think, a specific responsibility for the church to figure out what it is we're looking at, to remind folks, first of all, that the creation is good. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric in our world now that somehow some things are so evil there is no good in them. They can't be transformed. There is no hope for conversion. A lot of that goes on in the discussion around crime and punishment. We have some human beings that just need to be written off. They need to be locked up. They need to be executed. They need to be done away with. Traditionally, Christianity has really been uh, absorbed in the idea of personal salvation. And sometimes this is pictured as going to heaven when you die, you know, so you leave the earth behind altogether and go to heaven and everything will be perfect up there. But the Bible itself has a very strong um, emphasis on, on the transformation of these principalities and powers. It's not willing to give up on them. There's this wonderful uh, scene in chapters 21 and 22 of the book of Revelation in which the, you know, the nations were all liquidated it looked like in chapters 19 and 20 and the vultures came and picked over their bodies I mean it's a very gory scene and so you figure well the nations are finished I mean that's it no more nations and then suddenly in chapter 21 here come the nations marching into the holy city of Jerusalem which has come down from heaven to, uh, from God to the earth and and these nations are bringing their glory it says into the heavenly city the holy city which I take to mean their, their contribution to, to, the, to world culture, you know, like Guatemalan clothing with all the brilliant colors and French cooking and <laughs> all the other contributions every country has made. Uh, and then it says in chapter 22 uh, that the tree of life is there 
and the leaves of the tree were for the healing, 